Всем здравствуйте. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much. You like the guy. <laughs> I think they're clapping for you, Kerry. <laughs> I'm with a popular guy. You never used to say that to me. Well, just you and I can't leave the 7.30 report alone. <laughs> oh, dear. This is, the, this is the conversation we're having about the conversations that we've had for the book, uh, which we're building on the conversations we had for the television series, which also just happens to be the longest continuous conversation of my life. <laughs> Paul Keating, uh, for a man who has always said he would never write an autobiography, uh, you've invested a great deal of time in the television series and now the book. Why relinquish control over your own story and the chronicling of your place in history? Why do it this way? Um, well, biographies are of their essence self-serving. I mean. You can make them as neutral, I'm sure, as you wish, but they will reflect your view of the world, your ra the rationality of your thought processes, etc. And and I suppose there is a certain legitimacy in that. But anyone who's any good never wrote about themselves. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, the idea of sitting down now on the 5th of March 1986, we had a meeting in the Cabinet ante room and I said to John Dawkins and he said to me and Bob came in and, you know, uh, too much, too much. <laughs> I, suspect, uh, I suspect that most of the people, judging by the applause at the start, I suspect most of the people here have already seen the television series, so although that was the foundation for the book. Um, I'll try to avoid repetition for you, but I think it's important that we touch on some of those kind of cornerstones. And I know that, uh, that you said, uh, in terms of where the Keating story sprang from, the, the drive, the ambition, and the passion, and the curiosity about power, you've said that your mother's influence was paramount, and your grandmother, who put you on a pedestal and gave you what you call the love quotient. You described your father as a sweet guy and your mother as a killer. Yeah. Now, that got my attention. How, how, how did that play out within the family? Presumably the killer woman still got on reasonably with the sweet guy. Well, most of the time, <laughs> most of the time. Um, you know, occasionally when dad was really exasperated, you say, you know, she's a shrew, you know, she's a shrew, you know. <laughs> but, uh, no, there was this nice, um, nice creative uh, thing between them. Uh, uh, Dad was always, had, had, the, had the big, expansive, kindly, soft view of the world. And Mum did to a point, but she had the hard edge, you know, had the objectives. She was like a, like a lot of women born in the 1920s, um, and who lived through the war years, they never got their, they never got a real go at, at, a, a, at, a, at a, a career, a professional life, or a life in their own, in their own self, their own name. And so their lives were lived through their families uh, and through the aspirations for their children. Mm. And I think this is true of my mother. You know. Right. Well, that, that, that view would be true of a generation then. But uh, you, were, you were one out of the box in many ways. Well, well I mightn't have been at the time. Uh, I mightn't have been at the time, but I do think that, uh, that my grandmother died when I was 12, but you know, I was devastated when she died. Um, and the, the, you know, I could do no wrong with her. I mean, I was the absolute ace, you know. Mm. And, and you, I do think you carry that with you. And the, so in my case, the grandmotherly love and the motherly love uh, and, 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 and my father too. But, 
you know, you carry it around with you. And, uh, and Did you ever have a moment, uh, and, and we'll come to aspects of confidence later, but did you ever have a moment when that self-belief, that confidence deserted you? That, well, that, I don't that know. Was in, that I don't was know vested I, in you by your grandmother. Yeah. I don't know I had the self-belief all, all the way through, but because, you know, it's the getting of wisdom. It takes you... Confidence takes you a long time to grow through experience, mostly, you know. But... I mostly thought, even as a young young boy, you know, I had the f I had the field covered, you know, I, the observatory covered. Like at school with teachers, I would I would sort of mark them about the way they conducted the class. <laughs> you know? uh, did, did you ever tell them the marks? No, no, and uh, and I and I and you know, if a teacher chewed a boy out, I think, you know, impolitic language, bad behaviour. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, um, where another guy was charming, and you, so I, you know, I, I, I was already assessing them. You know, I did he, did uh, did any of your teachers ever call the kids unrepresentative swill? <laughs> <laughs> they call them worse than that. <laughs> yeah. You um, interesting also that you identified Churchill as the influence that inspired your step down the path to public service at a very young age. Yeah. First, his politics were very different to yours. Second, he was a primary driver behind the disaster of Gallipoli. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, he fought tooth and nail to keep Australian troops on the other side of the world when we were so th seriously threatened by the Japanese on our do doorstep. Mm -hmm. So why Churchill? Well, he was big-brained and, and brave to a fault, you know? And, and you know, he, 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 he had what I think is moral clarity. Um, and as it turned out, early he came up with one of the central ideas of the 20th century, that Adolf Hitler was a psychotic criminal who couldn't be dealt with. You know, and he pinged him and stayed on him. Uh, I mean, the bigger figure is Roosevelt, the bigger figure, mm. you know. But, but as you say, Churchill had... He had many. He had many errors, including Gallipoli. Uh, but nevertheless, I used to think, if this is the business this guy is in, this is the business to be in. I mean, what he what he knew, he, he knew from the beginning. He had leverage. If you, you can be in the you can be in the in the British aristocracy and upper class, but the moment you get the executive power, the executive government power, you get the leverage. And it was the leverage I could always see. If you could get the power, you could use it with the leverage. The, the point was getting it and not being afraid of it and using it. And that's what he was always doing, you know, mm. always doing. So what was it about Roosevelt mostly? What, what were the big things about Roosevelt that appealed? I, th I think Roosevelt is probably the, gr the greatest figure of probably all history. Probably all history. That's a huge statement. Yeah. Well, a lot of people disagree with me, but when you think about it, he, he pushed, he, 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 he saved the, the biggest democracy, the, the biggest economy from failure in the 1930s against all the orthodoxy um, by embracing deficit budgeting and Keynesian policies. And at the same time, then, as he moves through all of this, uh, he, he takes on, only with the provocation of Japan and Pearl Harbor, but the Second World War and, of course, the assault on Europe in the final analysis. So he's, he's president from, what, 1932 to 1945, 13 years, which was a very long, very long period, and if, if, essentially changes the world. You know, fundamentally changes the world. And does it after he contracts polio at the age of 34. So he's dragging himself around on a pair of... He's dragging himself around on a pair of uh, walking sticks and, you know, you know, he can't stand at all and he makes himself governor of New York, then wins the Democratic primary for president, then wins the election and goes on winning them. <laughs> he wouldn't have gone down in your estimation for his... Uh attitude to the establishment money, the old money of America. Yeah, well, of course, he was from Hyde Park in New York, you know. He, 
his house is on the Hudson River up from the Vanderbilts. I mean, they were toffs, you know. Uh, uh, but, you know, he stared, he stared the whole establishment down and he had, he had that very Englishy sing-song voice, you know. He used to sing the sentences, you know. I welcome, he said, the contempt and the hatred of my enemies, you know. I take it on board as a compliment, you know. And, and he did. He, 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 had the, he suffered the contumely of the, virtually the whole American wealthy class to look after the ordinary person in the Depression. There's really been no one like him, I don't think. Very similar ring to what Jack Lang told you. Yeah, well, you, Lang haven't, you haven't arrived until you've got a decent stock of enemies. Of course, of course, of course you know. <laughs> I, mean, you, I mean... You said about that one with alacrity. Yeah, well, that's right, because it defines you. I mean, the supporters define you, and ipso facto, the enemies define you, you know? I mean, you can say, oh, well, I'm a paler shade of grey, so most of the country loves me. You know, there's no point in that, you know? No. So... <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so... And, and, of course, Lang was like this. I mean, Lang, Lang tried to save a very poor community from the worst... You know, the, the, the depression in Australia was as severe or more severe than in the United States. And Lang was the only person really putting his hand up for the common person, you know? And, and with the same economic ideas as Roosevelt. Mm. I'm going to bypass the first half of your parliamentary life and focus on the Hawke-Keating years and then your time as Prime Minister. Mm. You were new to the Treasury portfolio on a very sharp learning curve and you shaped and refined your reform agenda as you went, really. You did not have the whole framework in your head at the start. Oh, no, no. Uh, but how do you distill down now the reform framework through the Hawke years with you as Treasurer? How do you distill that framework down to its essence? Well, look, let me say this be first, Kerry. I approached the whole thing with what I hoped was a different philosophy about political leadership in Australia. And that was the attempt to make good policy into good politics, instead of what I'd grown up in, mm. that the only good politics were the tricky politics. Politicians who treated the public as mugs, did nothing year in, year out, swept structural problems under the carpet, you know, failed to sort of see the international economic signs, uh, you know, periods when we had, you know, double-digit unemployment, double-digit inflation, long-time term, terms of trade decline, for 20 or 30 years, and everyone, everyone's keeping mum, you know? So that, that was tricky, that was regarded as good politics. I, I took the view that maybe we could, we could change the way leadership functions by making good politics into good politics by educating the public to the value of the good policy. To let the public understand if they're not getting the good policy, they're getting sold down. So you turn the good, policy into good politics. And from that, you create a reform platform. And if you keep running, the public reward you as you keep going. And see, so Bob and I won five elections on the trot, fundamentally out of good policy. All the time burning no the tricks. capital. Hmm? No tricks? Well, well, <laughs> uh, not, not many tricks. Not many, just, not many tricks. Just, I mean, just I a mean, few big ones. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm tricky, but I'm tricky, but... <laughs> But, but, but in terms of fidelity to the, to the, to the undertaking, no, not many tricks. And, and I think that once the public started to see value, they say, look, these guys are onto something, they're doing something. And so if you, if you keep doing it, they'll keep supporting. See, these are three-year parliaments. They mm. run out very quickly. If you keep doing it, they keep supporting you. Now, you know, events come, you know, you get washed around by, you know, world events, you know, stock market crashes and terms of trade shifts and all of this sort of stuff. It's a rocky sea out there. Mm. But if they think, if they think the ship of state has a focus and has direction, they'll support you. So I thought with that, we, we had to change the whole paradigm of leadership to do what we did. We had to change the whole sicko dusted under the carpet, approach the public life in Australia. 
And you don't think uh, you don't think Gough Whitlam was about that too? Oh no, Gough was. Gough was, but but you've got to stand on your feet long enough to do it. Three years is not enough. <laughs> we, th two years and eleven months is not thirteen years. Mm. In thirteen years, you get a lot done. Mm. You uh, claim so much of the credit for the reform program, and I know this was ha this was certainly not a universal view, but a lot of people expressed the view to me after the television series, you know, you listen to Paul Keating and you get the sense that he did it all. Uh, but there were many other talented players in that oh, process. Of course, it was, a, it was a hugely talented, and I said on the program, it was a hugely talented cabinet, you know, probably the most talented cabinet in the post-war years, um, in all of the fields, health, you know, foreign policy. This is true. This is true, but there has to be a guiding light and there has to be driving. You, you must drive, you must drive the show, you know. And the, the responsibility always comes to the authority figure. It's like if you're the copper on the top of the spire, you get the lightning, right? You get the carbon black, right? Um, so if the authority figure will take the responsibility, the system will support that figure, right? But you've got to take the responsibility, which is a big responsibility. But where's Bob Hawke in that? Hmm? <laughs> well, he, well, well Bob, Bob was, t of course, taking responsibility in terms of the general stewardship of the government, but in terms of its spiritual nourishment and its drift, <laughs> you know, I took that on. I'm not, I didn't. I didn't. So, so I didn't take it on. I did it. I did it. And I did it for 13 years. Yeah. So t tell me what you mean by the spiritual nourishment. Well, well, I mean, I mean, when, when you get to beyond Marla. Yeah. No. What, I mean, what you, when you get to policy points where where corner cutting takes place, where shifty business takes place, you know, where options are too hard where options are too hard and a cabinet's sitting there for hours, scratching their head, you know. But it is the fidelity to the objectives and the ways which gives the cabinet the inner, the inner belief, you know, the inner cohesion. And so if you let, if you let the, uh, the essence dilute by taking secondary paths, then in the end, the cabinet's losing its inner power, you know, the inner power to push forward, to push the things forward. I mean, this was on a, this was, I was doing two budgets a year for 10 years, two a year for 10 years. Eight years. Eight years. No, no. But if I put, Felt like 10, but it was no, eight but no, but I, no, no, but if I put the prime ministerial ones in, there's one nation, working nation, you know, it's really, two budgets a year for 10 years, and I was just absolutely crammed full of changes, social and economic changes, you know? And you had to be doing them at a certain speed, you know? You had to be right most of the time. It's very hard to be right most of the time. Occasionally you're gonna, <laughs> occasionally you're gonna make a How mess. How long did it take you to live with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, that's, a, that's a heavy burden to carry, Paul. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, but, so, so a cabinet provided the, the colleagues think the show has got direction and it has verve and it has, you know, truth, then there's a bind, there's a commitment by all the members of the cabinet to the undertaking, which was fundamentally the internationalisation of the economy. Fundamentally, the internationalisation of the economy. I certainly don't want to dwell uh, the, the dark days of the relationship with Bob Hawke to overshadow other important aspects of the conversation tonight. So I'd like to deal with the good and the bad of that partnership in a, sure. in a yeah. um, contained way. Yeah. You clearly still place great store in that very productive partnership, and you're at pains to point that out sure. when we talk about it. Indeed, yeah. friendship yeah. Uh, in the early years of government. Lots of ups and downs. Well, not even the early years. Nearly all of the years. It's only really the last six to eight months Bob and I had problems.
Oh, I think there were some interesting moments in the banana. Oh yeah, no, well, there, there were, there were, but you and see, and the tax reforms. Yeah, I know, but I always for, look, you know, I, I always, I forgave Bob indiscretions, <laughs> Pro provided, provided he would let me keep my foot on the accelerator, right? <laughs> provided he, he let me keep my foot on the accelerator, I would live with the indiscretions. But when he started going for the break. That was when it was all over. It's an interesting concept to contemplate a car that only has an accelerator and no brake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, prime ministers are very useful to a treasurer. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, uh, but, but, but they are no longer useful if they don't do the tricks, right? <laughs> so when Bob stopped doing the tricks, I had to, I had to do Bob in. <laughs> the, the, first, the first really destructive moment wasn't until the budget of 88. That was the bringing home the bacon budget. Yeah. And, and the speaking of tricks, those very interesting days that followed. But whatever you came to think of him in the end, Bob Hawke was and is an authentic Labor hero. True. Why is there still so much anger in you about him? Oh, there's not. Look, I, look I, I, I've written no books, as you noted. I had done no television programs. I had done none of this stuff. Bob produced this, you know, nasty little book called The Hawke Government, uh, uh, which was a fundamentally an attack on me. And, and I, uh, you know, and he, and he produced this at a critical point of my prime ministership, you know? And I let that go. And then Bob and I, in later life, uh, I was going, visiting Bob's house. I attended his 80th birthday here, in, this, in, the, in the Benelong restaurant here. Um, and then he decided to send Blanche out there with another version of the, the Hawke government, which was essentially an attack on me and Hazel Hawke. And I could have said, you silly old bugger, and meant it, but he pushed me too far. And as a consequence, I decided, as a consequence, to do the series with you. I thought that might be and, the case. And, and, and the book. <laughs> uh, um, otherwise, otherwise they wouldn't have, he wouldn't have heard, you wouldn't have heard any more out of me. I was just going to let it all go. <clears throat> do you reckon you can let it go now? Oh, well, it's, I, you know, it's... No. There's no point in it, no. no. no there, there's, no, there's no point in it, you know. There's no, there's no point in it. Of course, I, I couldn't care less about it. The Prime Ministership, as you walked into office on December 20, 1992, what was your template for government? What was your vision? Well... Because Peter Walsh yeah. was quoted as saying, Keating coming into the Prime Ministership was like the dog who'd been chasing cars and he suddenly caught one and didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Yeah, but Peter was very jaunt. He left the game and he was very jaundiced by then. Now, look, I, I, I certainly knew what to do with it. I, look, I, I always thought, I always, I said this in the program, I always hoped and believed that Australia could be a great country. Not a mediocre country, but a great country. But to be a great country, you have to have a great idea about yourself. A new, uh, in our case, a new idea of ourselves, you know? I mean, you, you, you can't, no great country has a monarch of another country as their head of state. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Any, uh, any monarchists here tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no great country has a flag of another country in the corner of their flag. Right? Uh, but, but, but more than that, but more than that, no country which is great and feels itself great wants to live with the shame of the dispossession of its original people. Right? <laughs> so, so we, 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 we had to turn the place over. We had to, what I wanted Australia to be was an open, competitive, cosmopolitan country, which was a republic and which was locked into the Asian construct. 
That's what I wanted. And after I said to you on the program, Kerry, by 1991, I'd given the country a new economic engine and I wanted to turn the raft towards the place where our economic security and physical security could be best guaranteed, and that was in Asia, right? So in other words, see, we, we beat being marginalised like South Africa with apartheid by the skin of our teeth getting out of white Australia, by the skin of our teeth. We beat the, econo the, the economic doom by the changes that Bob and I presided over. By 1991, we've, we've now got ourselves an open, breathing, competitive economy. And real income growth starting to rise, inflation's down to one or two percent. The, the task then was to try and get these, the symbols of Australia, the resonances of Australia right. And that's, uh, that's what I wanted to do with the Prime Ministership, you know, uh, and, and, you know, as you know, by 1994, we were getting 70% support for the Republic, 70. You know, the question, do you believe Australia should be a Republic? The answer was coming back 70% in the positive, right? That would have been, had I won in 96, we wouldn't be a Republic now, mm. certainly, I think. Um, the other Listen, thing- Listen, you, uh, if I've got this right, you, yeah. Um, <coughs> approached Cheryl Curnow as the head of the Democrats. I'm not sure she was the head Democrats. of the Democrats. Then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And asked her if she'd support you through the Senate to fly two flags at Parliament House yeah. while you waited for Australia to support a new flag. Yeah. And the second of those flags was the... Eureka flag. Eureka flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, Cheryl tried her best with it, but she just, I don't, her party just wouldn't come at it. But it was only an act of parliament to change it. You can change it with an act of parliament. Um, of course, the Republic requires a, a, a constitutional change, uh, a referendum. So, so why, did you need, why did you feel you needed her support? Why not just do it? <clears throat> well, it would have failed in the Senate because the coalition would have knocked it over. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I thought you said it didn't require an act of parliament. I'm oh, sorry, you're saying it required an act of parliament, yeah. not constitutional change. Not, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but so, the flag never actually seemed... The, the flag debate never really seemed to take off, did it? Well... Well, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of how many things you can take on at any one time. I and mean, the Republic was a big thing to take on. Native title was a big thing to take on. Uh, the APEC leaders, the, 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 the APEC political architecture in the Pacific was a big thing to take on. You know, this is all done in a four year period. You know, this is, this is hard going. So, so I, I had, you asked me the question, what did I come to the job about? What, what was it about? M I had, Basically, by 1991, I'd opened up the financial, the products, and I had the labour market to go, and I abolished centralised wage fixing in 1993 and moved to enterprise bargaining. So by 1993, I've got all the big economic changes fundamentally done, mm. including the tax system and most of the microeconomy. So let's, let's uh, focus for a minute on the Republic. You've now got Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister of Australia. You chose Malcolm Turnbull to chair your committee to come up with uh, an acceptable model yeah. uh, for a republic. So here he is as Prime Minister. Uh, do you expect him to lead the charge for a republic? Do you think that's feasible? That he well, can take his party along with him well, before it, he takes on the country? Well, in this parliament, no. I don't think in the balance of remaining of this parliament, which is over a year and a half or something, uh, I, I don't think, and given the sort of tensions within the Liberal Party, between the right of the Liberal Party, the monarchists, and if you like, the moderates and the republicans, I don't really think he's in a position to do that in this parliament. But in the following parliament, he could, he could certainly do it. He could certainly take it on. And it requires a prime minister to take it on. You can have all the republic, all the republican movements you, you like, but if a prime minister doesn't want to take this on, it won't happen. You know. And you'd expect that he would move straight to a minimalist model, because we had the situation with the Republican Convention <coughs> under John Howard as uh, as prime minister, uh, where the republican movement was split between those who wanted a yeah. popularly elected president and those who would accept a president elected by two thirds of the parliament, I think it was. Yeah. Um, that's a debate that almost never can be won, isn't it? Well, that's the problem, you see, when Howard shot 
the Republic down with these tricky referendum questions. He, he robbed Australia probably of, of the chance to go to the right model. And that's the appointed president. Because once you have one person in the system who's elected at large, the political power goes to that person. You see, let's say, look at Malcolm Turnbull. He's the member for Wentworth. That's his official position, the member for Wentworth. He's the leader of the Liberal Parliamentary Party, which has a majority in the House of Representatives, and so he's been appointed leader and therefore Prime Minister. But you approach a president who has there, who's sitting there by popular mandate, and you're saying, my party in the House of Representatives elected me leader, and by the way, I'm gonna require you to do the following things. And the president says, really? <laughs> really? I mean, the power will shift. In other words, we won't have a cabinet system like we have now. We won't have a representative parliamentary democracy quite like we have now. Uh, we won't have the, the diffusion of the executive power like we have now. It will all concentrate itself, much of it, in one person. This can't be good. Mm. How optimistic are you about it, that he can pull it off? Well, first of all... That, I... you, can, that you can stir the passions again. Well, I mean, what are we going to end up with? Charles and Camilla, for God's sake. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean... How did you feel when you watched uh, the, the kind of reception that, uh, and the flag waving for, uh, for Kate and Prince William? Well, I think Prince William is probably the nicest royal that's turned up out of that show for donkey's years. But, <laughs> but, 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 but the point is, we don't need him and his, his lovely wife as our heads of state. I mean, it's an affront to everything we've created here. Mm. <laughs> Enough Dorothy Dix is on the Republic. Yeah. Um, no, Jack Kerry, it would be a spoof. It's a spoof on everything we tried to do with ourselves to get this far in our history, to be leaning back there to wait for Prince Charles to, to inherit the throne. You know, I mean, it's, it's deeply sick. <laughs> foreign policy, fair to say that your two big foreign policy achievements, the relationship with Indonesia and uh, converting APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Forum from a useful but ministerial level forum engineered by Bob Hawke into a much more powerful and significant leaders forum. Yeah. Uh, you succeeded in that goal, but rather than talk about how you did it, I want to tease out a few anecdotes uh, from that process, your relationship with Bill Clinton. Can you describe how you fashioned the process with Clinton going into the first APEC leaders meeting at Seattle and the role you played there? Because the first president you raised it with was George Bush. You were sort of making progress with him as you courted the other leaders around Asia and the Pacific. Yeah. But then, of course, he was gone. You had to start again with Bill Clinton. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill Clinton, you might remember, more or less won that first election on the, on the slogan, it's the economy stupid. And he criticised George Herbert Bush for the first Iraq war. So he doesn't want to do geostrategic things. All of a sudden I walk through the door with a, with a piece of political architecture which connects North America across the Pacific to China, Japan, Indonesia and the rest of us. And, and he felt to be dabbling in that particular pond with a make, make, made a mockery of the things he'd said. So he said to me, look, if you can make this look like a trade body where trade and jobs across the Pacific is something I can support, um, then maybe we can get somewhere with this. So in further conversations, we agreed we'd have the first meeting in Seattle, which is the home of Boeing and Microsoft, so Bill Gates turned up and Boeing turned up and it was all about jobs across the Pacific in China and Asia, uh, notwithstanding the fact it was a, you know, a hugely political body because you had the president and prime ministers of all these governments together for the very first time. And of course, once you put presidents and prime ministers together, they're not going to worry about the trade agenda. They're going to get on with the real talk, <laughs> are they? So describe some of those moments, I think, for instance, <clears throat> where you were in the middle uh, almost forcing the President of the United States and the 
leader of China to shake hands. And yeah, yeah. It was Japan very, and China. Yeah, very stiff. We are at this Blake Island and they were very stiff. Yeah, Jiang Zemin, who was quite a jovial guy, uh, but uh, uh, Bill Clinton approached him like this, you know, that he was not going to smile for the photo. It was very stiff, very cold. And, of course, with the Japanese and the Chinese, you know, they could barely do it. They could barely do it. Anyway, we mucked them all in. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and um, at, uh, you know, uh, it amused me, at the second meeting of APEC in Bogor, which was hosted by President Suharto, I had... Um, Jung Zemin doing the karaoke with Bill Clinton on the, on the, um, on the clarinet. <laughs> and, you know, if, you, if, if you're doing the karaoke with some guy and you're up there singing, it does reduce the strategic tensions quite a bit. <laughs> so, you know. But the other point is this, Kerry, when I became Prime Minister, before I turned up, the Australian Prime Minister only ever went to two bodies. The British Commonwealth meeting, which is a a sort of piece of old history, and the South Pacific Forum. That was it. Like Menzies for all the going on, that's all they ever went to. We never sat down with the United States, with the Chinese, Hang with on, the Japanese. when you say you never sat down with the United States, we had a treaty with the yeah, United States. Yeah, no, no, but we never sat... You mean in, you mean in, in large forums? In, 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 in pan-Pacific or pan-global okay. forums. Right. We were never there. And... Uh, um, I, I just could see in, when, the, when the Cold War finished, the, the, the Soviet Union was dissolved a week before I became Prime Minister. And with that geostrategic bipolarity gone, the two magnets gone, you could see this huge strategic opportunity opening up. But the Americans couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it, you know? So it, we had to basically drag them into it, then drag the Chinese into it, and then, you know, the Japanese would only come in if they thought I could get the Americans, and, you know. But, 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 you know, the APEC leaders' meetings have been a hugely significant thing. I mean, China got in the WTO via APEC, you know. Mm. Um, the Chinese supported the United States after September 11 at APEC, you know, which took the US focus off China away. And now, you know, if you look at the latest trade agreement, you know, the, the TPP, the one that the, the government's just negotiated, with the United States, that excludes China. It excludes a number of the countries of Southeast Asia. So it will, it will again fall to APEC to do a broader trade deal than the TPP. So, you know, this was something, a, a gift of Australian foreign policy and something I knew, I mean, I had George W, George Herbert Bush here down to play golf with Bob nominally. Actually, he was coming down to play golf with Bob. So I thought, I'm going to get this guy in a headlock and sell him a real idea. <laughs> yeah? what, what was your handicap at golf? <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. So um, I, I want to get a little bit of descriptive from the Bogor conference, which was the second APEC yeah. conference. And you, you've always said that uh, without Suharto of Indonesia, you could never have got APEC right. up. Right. Uh, he was the big guy, you said, yeah. in that. Um, but what, what hand did it deal Australia in that forum in those early years that the initiative had come from Australia and that you, you had been the initiator through these other countries? Well, and, and how was that reflected in Bogor? Well, it, well, well for us, we became virtually the secretariat because we were the founders, we were the secretariat. So what became the Bogor Declaration, which was open, open product markets in the Pacific by 2010 for developed countries and 2020 for developing countries, all came out of that declaration, which, which my foreign policy advisor, Alan Gingell, and I wrote in Canberra for President Suharto. So President Suharto is selling a free trade agenda in the Pacific written by us, you know? Uh, and of course, that, that completely sort of changed, that started to drop protectionist barriers for the last 20 years. I mean, the TPP, the things the Americans do now, much of it's about intellectual pro property. You know, it's not about product markets. They've been opened up for years, um, as a res in many respects, as a result 
of the Bogor Declaration. So how did you then shepherd that through the second Bogor Conference? Well, I had to get past, uh, well, 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 you know, you had to deal with the people like the Japanese wanted to hang on to the rice. Uh, the, the South Koreans wanted to hang on to certain areas of manufacturing. You know, everyone had their pet, their pet industries. So you had to try and crunch them into, into, into accepting things. Um, and, you know, Sahato was a great chairman uh, of the thing. Uh, and Clinton, Clinton turned up uh, and, uh, a, three days after he lost the election, the, 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 the midterm, midterm, the midterm, midterm election, election, the so-called contract with America election. Newt with, Gingrich. With Newt Gingrich. And he arrived all bleary-eyed. And uh, I was, you know, he came because of me, fundamentally. Very nice of him to come. You know, he came, he wanted to keep his word. And he came, and we gave that the horse, and we took it to Japan and grew it further, you know. And, and that was the first time. So Australia has actually, you know, built the key piece of political architecture in the Pacific in, in those years, in my years. The way Paul described this in our conversation for the book, <clears throat> um, he's sitting there describing how he was dashing from delegation to delegation and helping with their amendments. <clears throat> and it sounded for all the world to me like a Labor conference. <laughs> because that was exactly what you do in a Labor conference, yeah. isn't it? Well, it's, 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 it's picking up the little nuances in the, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the words that officials have given presidents to read. You know, you think, bad, bad note there, bad note here. So you whip around, you know, and then you get the officials and try and get them sorted. And they get a new note up, you know. You know, so all that conference training, all that, the annual bloodbath at the town hall here, <laughs> a, a, actually stood me in good stead. <laughs> these, were far, these were far nicer people. <laughs> what about Australia's foreign policy in the world today? Briefly, Indonesia, the friendship has been severely tested in recent times. Do you yeah. think real damage has been done? And how firm can one friend be with another before a relationship is damaged? Well, I think Australia's, the possibility of Australia doing what we've done in the past, in my case with the APEC leaders meeting, um, in Kevin Rudd's case with the East Asia summit, I think these opportunities are passing us by now. The big guys are now dealing, dealing with each other, the US and China, you can see that now. Um, so we have to continue to play a role in those peak discussions, but I'd like to see us play more of a role in Southeast Asia. This is where we live. And the body, I think, which the opportunity that's going begging for Australia is ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which Sahade put together with Lee Kuan Yew. At the moment, in ASEAN, these big figures like Sahato, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and Mahatia, they're not there anymore, you know? And, so, and, and ASEAN is a little directionless now. I believe we should belong to ASEAN and we could give ASEAN heft, you know, geopolitical heft of a kind that I don't think they may necessarily give, that, give themselves. I wonder how ASEAN members would feel about hearing Paul Keating say that it would require Australia to give them heft. Well, it wouldn't require it, but we would help. We would, we would concentrate the effort. And the other thing is, you know, look, I have this thing called a seesaw analogy. I've used it a couple of times. Uh, at the fulcrum point, there's little movement, but on either end, you get the big movements. If you regard Southeast Asia as the fulcrum for this part of the world and movement is trouble, in the Indian Ocean, you've got India and Pakistan, both nuclear powers. In the Pacific, you've got China, Japan, and the United States. But at the centre, you've got this, this piece. Mm. I think we should be in there consolidating that to deal with the problems of the seesaw. Where does it leave us with our fundamentally primary relationship with the United States. You embraced the ANZUS Treaty with the US and recommended to Bob Hawke when he asked 
that Australia should have a limited role in the desert storm conflict with Iraq over the invasion of Kuwait. Ten years later, could you have resisted uh, endorsing Australian involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq alongside America after September 11? Well, and much more recently, could you have, as a Prime Minister, resisted a role for Australia in Iraq against ISIS and now in Syria? Well, I would never have been in Iraq in, 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 uh, after September 11, 2001. You know, <clears throat> never. <clears throat> the thing is that the, the first Iraq war was a UN-mandated war. Bob and I had a discussion about it. I said, look, Saddam Hussein has walked into Kuwait. The UN has been neutered for years in the Cold War. Neutered. The bipolarity has neutered the UN. If, with the bipolarity now gone, the UN wants to step up and the United States will materially support a UN effort and we get a UN mandated agreement to go into Iraq, I think we should go in. But if we go in early, the price will be lower. So I want to go in quickly so we didn't have to do much, right? A couple of ships up the top of the Gulf, no troops, no planes, right? Um, but the second Gulf War was an act, an act without a UN mandate. You know, and as a consequence, it's completely destabilised the 1973 settlement between Egypt and, and Israel. The 73 settlement, in many respects, brokered by Kissinger, has been now blown away by George W. Bush, Tony Blair, and John Howard. And what about, what about Syria and, uh, and Iraq over ISIS? Well, that's, 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 that's it now, now. I mean, the, 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 these states are no longer sovereign. There's no, they're no longer sovereign states. They're just... Parts of them are controlled by different bodies at odds with one another. And now, of course, we've got Russia. The great problem about Syria is when Syria was a contained civil war, if you like, with, with support on either side, that was one question. The question we now have is, of course, we've now got big power rivalry starting to be played out in Syria, with the Russians now, mm. now supporting uh, Assad, right? Uh, and this goes back to the fact that the Americans, at the end of the Cold War, the principal task the Americans had at the end of the Cold War was to bring Russia into Europe. Instead of that, what did they do? They started biting off bits of the pie crust. They let Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic go into NATO. They extended NATO. And then finally, the Baltic states. And then finally, they tried, of course, uh, with um, uh, uh, in, in Putin's last, in, in, in um, Ukraine, yeah. which Putin would never have let them do, never let them do. So instead of, in, instead of, controlling the Atlantic with the United States on one side, the United States of Europe and the EU on the other, with the integration of Russia into Europe, they pushed the Russians off, bit, they moved the, the, the NATO boundary close to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and in many respects they've created Putin. You know, they've, they've, they've grown Putin. And Putin is now going to strike them back. You is know. there any place for Australia, any valid place for Australia over there now? Armed. Um, I, I'll give you an honest answer, Jerry. I doubt it, but I need to be better informed militarily than I am now. OK. How do you think Australia should respond to America's determination to push back against China's more aggressive approach to its territorial claims in the South China Sea? <laughs> well. Well, I think... Uh, Answer that in two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it just in, in short, are we, are we now in a position we should not be where we're being asked to play sides? Broadly, yes. We should not be in this position, right? Um, uh, look, the Nixon-Mao deal of 1971 was really all over when the Soviet Union was dissolved in 91. The Nixon-Mao pact, which, where China recognised 
United, the United States, the sovereignty of the United States and the primacy of the United States in Asia, militarily, uh, was about China dealing with the then aggressive Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union dissolved 20 years later in 1991, the underpinnings of the Nixon-Mao pact went away. Uh, the idea that, I mean, Japan has been a strategic client of the United States for 70 years. The idea that China will be a strategic client of the United States is just nonsense. China has an economy of two thirds the size of the United States. In six or seven years from now, it'll be the same size as the United States. And there's just no possible way the Chinese are gonna ever accept from now on Chinese, uh, Ameri American primacy in the Pacific such that the Americans essentially can patrol their coast or under which the Americans decide issues of strategic primacy. That game is all over. I'm going to move on uh, with the time. I want to, th this is a bit of a, a quantum leap. I want to come from uh, geopolitics to your personal style. <laughs> and, well, you were uh, going well for a while there, but... Uh, Neil Blewett. <laughs> Neil Blewett, uh, uh, who was a senior member of your cabinet, uh, kept a very interesting diary through those years. And, uh, and he kept an eye on how you dressed. And more to the point, why? Yeah. Uh, is he right that you actually chose your clothing very carefully depending on what was on your agenda in terms of power dressing, when to dress for a serious conflict or a serious moment and so yeah. on? He also talked about... about the times in cabinet you were like the black widow spider ready to pounce. Yeah. Well, I would if I had a big, a really big matter on. Um, I wouldn't turn up in a light suit with a sort of jazzy tie. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, turn up, I'd turn up like this. And of course, I used to do my nonchalant act. I'd have the Christie's and Sotheby's catalogues there. Uh, <laughs> And, and they'd, say, they'd think, he's distracted. But then I'd strike, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and the other thing is, you, my long suit was reply. Always has been reply. It's always good to listen to what the person in front of you is saying. So as the colleagues used to speak in cabinet, I used to make a note. I, I, I always use a black fountain pen because you can write faster with ink than you can a biro. Right? You can get it down, right? And in reply, it's very interesting. And when the, the debate goes on, you say, well, that's not what you said 20 minutes ago, you know? Uh, and you go back to it. Or, you, or alternatively, you say, look, you made this point, this point, this point, so we can get to this point, okay? So, so uh, there, 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 there is a thing in a cabinet process where the, the sum of the parts in the end is bigger, is larger than the individual contributions if a cabinet's working properly. And therefore, the, 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 the Prime Minister should be both a good listener and in the end a director. But you're not directing all the time, you're listening and you're steering and, and you're if accumulating you have to, the evidence. Uh, yeah, and you're keeping the with note. With the fountain yeah. pen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, or the, or the, I, I think also uh, at times with the slightly hooded eyes as if you might be dozing off. Yeah, like yeah. the snake in the sun. Well, that's what someone said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember that, that, that uh, President Mitterrand, you know, who I liked. He was great fun, Mitterrand. Uh, and uh, towards the end of it, uh, end of his life, he... They said, uh, someone's uh, French interviewer said, Monsieur le Président, you're, you're more, you're quieter these days, you know, you're more relaxed. And Mitron said, yes, he said, yes. I'm like a cat, but I still have my claws. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did notice over the years that you tended to have an eye to the sort of, the physical attributes of people, like the voice. Uh, th this, is, this is attributes as you saw them working for a politician. Yeah. And, and you've said for the book that if you'd had Barry Jones's voice, yeah. how much more you might have cut through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Barry, 
He was the foghorn leghorn of the show. You could hear him, <laughs> you could hear him across the whole place, you know. Um, and, and that would have, you know, that, that, that projection really means something if you, if, if, if you, have, that, if you have that natural gift. So how you know? would you describe your voice? Oh. Well. <laughs> uh, soft, weak. <laughs> oh, it's not strong. So you were conscious that you had <clears throat> to project yourself more? You had to push harder? Well, in the end, the arguments are bullets, aren't they? I mean, in the end, the arguments do tell, mm. you know. So you, you line them up, you know. They're, they're coming down in a series, mm. a declining series of, you know, that have a certain momentum about them. What, what it told me, Paul, to some degree, rightly or wrongly, was that right from the start, uh, as you were on your journey mm. up to the pinnacle of Australian politics, you were making studies as you went. I mean, we know about how this guy used to collect uh, all the early Labor Daily newspapers uh, decades before he was active uh, as a part of his ed self-education process on the kind of history and the, uh, the, the nuances and the culture of Labor culture. and the, the way people played their game and who the, where they came from. Yeah. And you were like that all the way through, really, weren't you? You were yeah. always analysing. Yeah, yeah. Understanding the field of play all the time. The field keeps changing, and you've got to keep changing with it, you know? You know, um, and in every epoch, in every week, in every month, you know, the game keeps changing. I mean, it's a, it's a very sophisticated business. I mean, you look at all that stuff that goes on in Canberra, and people don't think it's sophisticated, but it is very sophisticated. Mm. So, so... I used to try and, and, and pick up the, the resonances, you know, the, the culture, you know, of things. Um, and I did this first with the Labor movement, as you say, correctly. And of course, attending those town hall conferences, the Labor Party has met in New South Wales in the Sydney town hall since 1893. It still does. You know, so there's an enormous history there. And if you understand where the forces are arraigned and what they represent, you can, you can do things with them. I'm going to keep sort of pushing <coughs> it along now because uh, uh, given that we started late, I'm going to aim for about another 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we can't let Marbo pass because it seemed to me that... Um, have, I, have I got this right? Of all the things that you regard as your achievements in your time in office, would that be the greatest? Marbo. I, I don't Individually. Like, I, I, don't, I don't like rating things as the greatest. Uh, I mean, saving Australia from its international mediocrity is probably the greatest. That is, the internationalisation. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, and I say, in you know, I'm, this I'm, way, in terms of emotional investment. In terms of emotional investment, yeah, that was probably, it would, would have been the biggest. The biggest emotional investment and commitment was, mm. to, was to the whole notion of Aboriginality and, and, and trying to deal with the original colonial grievance, the dispossession. And the Native Title Act went some part of the way in doing that. Mm. But of course, through the suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, that land remains up to the Aboriginal people dispossessed, you know. Native title can't give them that back. So, but we could give them back that which had not been alienated by grants of interest in land by state land managers mm. over the years. So, uh, so that was the that was that. But I just want to make this point about about Australia and 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 the reformation of the economy. Since 1991, we've had now 20, 24 years of continuous economic growth. Real wages have risen by 46 percent, and disposable incomes by 58 percent. Real, that's above inflation. Where are you basing those figures on? Hmm? What are you basing those figures? Oh, on? they're just a, they're, they're just they're, they're just the official numbers, um, and 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 so <laughs> the, if you take the equivalent of the United States in the same period, real wages would have risen for the middle class by maybe three or four percent. Here they've risen by forty six percent, and as the price level has dropped, as inflation and goods became cheaper, 
You've got real wages rising and the price level falling, so disposable income has, 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 has risen by nearly 60%. I mean, this, is, this was first in the world, first in the world. And this is what pulled Australia out of that poverty we were heading for in the 1970s, you know, under Fraser and Howard and Menzies and all the rest of them. I mean, you know, Bob, the Hawke and Keating governments rescued Australia from that mediocrity. That's the big achievement of those years. That's the primary achievement. Um, and we did it in the nick of time, as Asia was growing, in the nick of time. Uh, on these other issues... Um, I mean, along the way, Paul, and, and I don't want to get bogged down in this, but I do have to acknowledge that yeah. uh, at the end of that process, there came this thing called the recession. Yeah, but we've which, had... Which was, the, yeah. which was the deepest recession after the true, Depression. True, true, Kerry, true, true, true. But why was it there? Because we had a massive explosion in demand that was going to blow the wages system and inflation again. So we're going to go back to where we'd been in 1983. Mm. You know, by 1990, we're going to go back to 83, back to double-digit inflation and double-digit unemployment. So the recession sort of saved us from that happening and then gave us a quarter of a century of growth and wealth. I mean, look how rich, how wealthy the place is now. Look how wealthy it is. I mean, there's we're still disparity, Paul. Yeah, there's still disparity, but we're number two in the world. What was the other day? It was a Credit Suisse put out the numbers: three hundred sixty-four thousand dollars on average. I mean, this place got rescued from from slipping under the waves, you know, by the Labor Party. And yet we can't. We Party. still, to this day, can't seem to get it. We still can't seem to get education right, we can't seem to get health right. No, that's true, but we still have, thanks to the Labor Party, a universal health insurance system. I mean, you, you can walk, you know. And, and, and let me tell you this, Kerry, when Bob and I turned up, three kids in 10 completed secondary school. Three in 10. When I finished, it was nine in 10. Nine in 10. Uh, contemporary politics. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, we've seen just recently, we've seen a change in leadership uh, yeah. of the country, yeah. as well as the Liberal Party. Sure. Um, what sort of a leader, what sort of a natural instinctive leader do you think Malcolm Turnbull is? You know him pretty well. I know him well. Well, the first thing I'd say, uh, to make a general comment, the bar is now so low. <laughs> that, 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 no. I, I, can, I, I can see you've been thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bar is so low, you've only got to just step over it to, <laughs> to be approved of. I, I think... Uh, but you asked me about Malcolm Turnbull. I, I think Malcolm Turnbull has grown through his parliamentary career. I think his defeat for the leadership uh, in 2010, I think it was, uh, was a traumatic event for him. I think it's made him think about himself and the country. And I think he'll be a better leader for that having happened. The real question is, can he take the now very right-wing Liberal Party anywhere back near the centre? That'll be the real test, you know, or whether he's stuck with the Looney Tune show on the right, <laughs> you know, uh, and, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and whether he can actually, by being a popular leader, whether the Liberal Party's core establishment will give him the room he needs to, to change the balance within the Liberal Party back to some sort of centrist position. So That's tell me this, is there real scope for Malcolm Turnbull to do to Labor what you and Bob Hawke did to the Liberals? In other words, you moved more from the left to the centre and pushed the Liberals further to the right. Are you suggesting it's possible that he can occupy the centre and push Labor, what, to the left? or pass them and leave them over on the right well, too. The trouble, the, trouble, the, the, trouble is, the trouble is for a large part of the period from 96 until now, the Labor Party gave up the constituency Bob and I created for it. That is, all those self-employed people out there 
all the service economy, all those people with the rising incomes, all those aspirational types were made basically by us. You know, we created this group. You know, I cut the top marginal rate of tax under Howard from 60% to 47. 60 to 47. The corporate rate from 46 to 33 with full dividend imputation, you know, and set up occupational superannuation. I mean, you know, the Labor Party had that model in its hands and it dropped it from 96 through to now. They broadly dropped it. Now, so the Labor Party runs a real risk that Malcolm Turnbull will do, as you suggest, Kerry. That is, if he can shift those pre-Copernican obscurantists in his party <laughs> at all, and they give him a bit of room to move towards the centre, it will present great strategic difficulties for the Labor Party. Uh, now, I actually received some, letter, some uh, questions that were sent in through social media, and I'm going to ask <coughs> this one because I think it's terrific. You once described yourself as the Placido or Placido Domingo of Australian <laughs> politics. <laughs> what singer would you compare Tony Abbott to? <laughs> and this, this actually came from Evan Williams, and I'm not sure if it's the same Evan Williams who once wrote speeches for Gough Whitlam, but uh, do go on. Yeah, well, I... I well... <laughs> I wouldn't say Gary Glitter, because... Um, <laughs> He's too, he was too flash for Tony. You're thinking of the lycra. Uh, um, no, you stumped me with that one. All right. Bill Shorten? Bill Shorten. Who, which singer? Yes. Singer. Are we talking about operatic singers? Uh, uh, um, it's too, I think it's too hard for me to pull the names up. Uh, I don't think singers are the analogies to make um, with these people. Um, I don't see Bill as a singer. <laughs> Do you see him as anything? Oh, yeah, no. Bill, um, Bill, uh, your 7.30 slip is showing, uh, Kerry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, no, Bill is a, is a real Labor person. Uh, I'm a with, kind of gentler person. With, with real Labor values and... He's now got a great challenge to sort of market those values and put them in a framework. But Labor does have, it, have itself a, a big problem now, doesn't it? Quite apart from anything else. I mean, having removed two leaders in the incredibly messy way they did and then having changed the rules under which the leader is elected, uh, if they find themselves... I'm saying this is hypothetical, of course, Paul. If they found themselves in a situation where they had a dud leader and couldn't remove him... <laughs> That, that, is a, that is a big problem. Well, Kevin Rudd, of all people, gave the Labor Party this rule. I mean, Kevin was really not an organisational Labor person ever. Mm. I, I was president of the party in New South Wales. I attended my first Labor Party conference at the, at the age of 18. Um, and so, in a, in a sort of a rash judgment, in my view, the party agreed to democratise the leadership by letting the members have a, a weighted vote in the selection of the parliamentary leader. Mm. The people who know the parliamentary leader best are the members of parliament. They see them every day. They're in the corridor conversations. They're in the sort of, they're in the sort of dining room discussions. You know, they, they, they see the cabinet, the shadow executive. They, get a, they have a very close idea. And I thought it was always a great mistake to take the selection of the leader away from the parliamentary party and give it to the broad membership, you know. Um, they say, oh, well, in that case, you're, you're, you know, you're not in favour of democracy. Well, I'm in favour of, of an informed democracy, but not an uninformed one, right? So Are you saying that Labor's own rank and file is an uninformed yeah, rank and file? In terms of the sharpness and suitability of the leader, yes, of course I'm saying that. Of course I am. They just, they, they just, they don't have the proximity to make the judgment. They make the judgment to send members to Canberra. Yeah, but then the members have got to then create a society amongst themselves, and in that political society, you choose someone to best lead you. But you put your finger, you identified the problem 
if a leader today can't cut the mustard, there's no way other than some messy removal that goes on, or the leader, he or she decides to resign. But it was always best, look, just, just, just take, when, when I beat Bob Hawke, we were 31% in the poll, 31. I won the election in 93 with 45%, right? So the Labor Party, right at the penultimate moment, made the decision to shift from Bob to me. In the same way as the Liberal Party has now made a decision to shift from Tony Abbott to... That's what parties with dexterity do. But when you take the dexterity away and you give it to a rank-and-file, you know, feel-good democratic structure, you lose all the smart footwork. Now... There are many ways we could end this, uh, this conversation tonight, Paul, but I'm going to choose one because it's a great story from the book, I think, and, and it was a rare... You showed a rare moment of self-doubt. <laughs> and that was uh, in November of 1992, since you raised the 93 election, in November of 92. So through this whole year, you've, you've produced One Nation. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. Up and down all the time in the polls. Uh, there was almost no point at which you were the actual favourite to win the election. You were the... You were trailing uh, in the odds. So, November of 92, you, you suddenly come up with the idea, or you, you barely consulted anyone, you still hadn't really formulated the idea in your head properly, but one day you suddenly take it on yourself to go into question time and declare to the masses and your colleagues that uh, the Australian people shouldn't think that in, that in getting rid of you and putting John Hewson in, they, they could also avoid the GST because, of course, Labor and the Democrats would combine to vote it down in the Senate. Yep. And you went into the Parliament and you said, if we lose the election in opposition, we will support the Hewson government in passing the GST. Yeah. Please tell me uh, how you reacted when you saw your own side plunge into the depths of despair yeah. and the Liberals partying into the night. They were, yeah, yeah. They, the, the Liberals were euphoric because I got asked a question by Hewson, I think, and I gave the answer extemporaneously, you know. I mean, you know, in the end, I'm an instinct player, you know, and I was playing the instinct. And I thought, this, the public think they can have this guy and not get the GST. So I'm going to tell them if they get him, this, this coal fish washed ashore from the recession... <laughs> Uh, they're going to get, they're going to get the GST as well because we're going to support it. Well, of course, my people are saying you've lost the election. You've, you know, you've just, we've lost the election in, in three sentences. The Liberals were euphoric, um, and for a moment I had to doubt my judgment. For a moment. Uh, how, how did you recognise that feeling? Uh, 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 and, when I, when I went back to my office, they were all, they were all you know, getting around like someone had died, you know. So, um, uh, so, I, so, of course, I was pretty sure I had euchred this guy because the public would work out, we get this guy, we get the GST. So I decided to do an interview on the 7.30 report that night with Paul... Not with me. That with was Paul before Lynham. my time. Paul yeah, Lynham. And... and, and I thought, he's going, to be go he's going to pick up all the atmospherics, he's going to be going for me. So, of course, I used to go to an acupuncturist in Canberra every Friday night, and I, dr I dragged my legs into this place, and this guy, he really had me off pat, you know, I, like the good ones, you know, they, they can f lever kidney, heart and spleen, they pick you up in a second, you know. And he'd give me the needles, and I'd go to sleep, and, you know, 20 minutes or later, I'd walk out like it was Monday morning. You know, really. I mean, acupuncture makes you be relaxed, relaxed but brighter, not relaxed and dull, right? <laughs> so, so, like a Valium, makes you relaxed and dull. But uh, anyway, so I thought, look, I might need this guy. So I rang him up. I said, what are you doing tonight? He said, oh, no. I said, can you come round the lodge? He said, yeah, OK. So he came round and he gave me the acupuncture for about... I said, leave me here for half an hour. So I went to sleep for half an hour. 
And of course, it just calms you down, you know. I mean, I was like Zeus ready to throw the thunderbolts, you know. <laughs> you, know you know, and of course, uh, by the time I get down to line, I'm lying out twitching his face, and he's always twitching, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's, getting, he's getting ready to sort of give the king hit questions, you know. And of course, I just battered them off. And the end result was, of course, everyone said, God, you know, I think this is a masterstroke. I think you've actually, <laughs> I think you've actually beaten this, Houston. And in fact, from that point on, the thing turned, you know? It did turn. Uh, and so, uh, so you, uh, what's to tell you? You've got to r roll with the instincts, you know? I mean, risky, risky, but, but I mean, it really was for you. Throwing those liberals about. around. I said on your program, I used to throw them around like rag dolls. I did <laughs> for 20 years. I mean, it was such fun. Thanks. 